Welcome back to Bible study. I didn't announce last week what we would be studying this week. I think we hadn't quite fully decided, so we kept our powder dry. And after much prayer, discussion and a cup of coffee, we thought it would be quite good to move to St. Peter from St. Paul. Mm. And we've agreed on that, haven't we? So we're going to read from uh, Peter's first epistle wasn't to the Colossian church, it was to the Colossian church and every other church. Um, and Ian's going to read. 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, beginning at verse 1, and I'm reading in the New King James Version of the Bible. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. And that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last times. In this you greatly rejoice, Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise and honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed, not to themselves but to us. They were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into. Mm. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Lord, we just uh, firstly thank you for uh, the simple uh, fisherman, our brother Peter, for his uh, dedication to you while you walked uh, with him and for his humility things that he in the flesh may have rejected, that he received from you and, and the revelation that came from you that we have before us today. So we just thank you for uh, Peter and uh, we thank you for uh, his faith and all this uh, wonderful words here in, in the letter that he wrote. We pray, Lord, you'll help us and just to hear from you and to speak. Uh, your word as we study this letter. Amen. 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 Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's quite a transformation from Peter, the fisherman. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't read it, um, Peter without thinking of, of the, the narrative of the, the Synoptic Gospels. Yeah. It's just you, you, you see it. He, um, there's an element here about, you know, there's Thomas, though you have not seen him. You know, and, and, and the Lord said to Thomas, blessed are those who believe, having not seen. And there's so much more here. Are we going to do it verse by verse, or are we going to try and do an overview of... <coughs> of well, I, I'd like to give a very slight overview to start yeah. with, and then yeah. perhaps, you know, go back and just pick, okay. them, pick up the various uh, elements from the verses. 
Peter, initially, obviously one of the early disciples, not just one of the disciples, one of the early disciples, walked with Christ for a good three years before his um, death and resurrection and ascension. Then he was very much involved in the Jerusalem church, right at the heart. And at that point, Jesus' resurrection had been witnessed by over 500 people. And then the day of Pentecost came and he preached and there were Jews from all over the world who gave their lives to Christ. There were added thousands uh, to the way. And then he devoted himself to teaching uh, leading the church and then when there was a dispute about the widows and the distribution of food they elected seven uh, deacons who would distribute the food so that they could devote themselves to prayer and the teaching of the word so this was Peter in the early days mm. by the time he wrote <clears throat> first and uh, second Peter it was towards the latter part where we're talking about 60 AD mm. plus. Mm. Uh, Paul had already become a convert. He had already established many churches within the Gentile world. He had already uh, written many letters as we see from Second Peter later. And in one sense, I can't help thinking that Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, reflects a lot of the way that Paul began his letters by saying, Paul, an apostle mm. of Jesus, mm. all right? Because stylistically, there is no precedent before these people wrote yeah. how they, an apostle opens a letter. Mm. But this is rem very reminiscent mm. of the way Paul did it. And we know that Peter has read Paul's letters. Mm. There's he some humility it. also, we're not going into the verses, but the fact that he didn't say, oh, Peter, the one who the Lord gave the keys to the kingdom. He, he said, an apostle. <clears throat> but by this stage in his life, he was preaching to and writing epistles to people who'd never met Jesus. In the early days, he could point to somebody in the crowd and say, you were healed by him or you heard him because you were one of the 5,000 that was fed mm. or you were one of the 4,000 or you followed him in so and so or you were at the crucifixion. He could point in the crowd and there'd be a handful of people at the very least mm. who knew who Jesus was. So his preaching style and the content of his preaching would have been totally different. Now, the vast majority of the people he's writing to had never laid eyes on Jesus at all. Yeah. And this was uncharted waters for him, mm. Mm. you see? Uh, which is why he's saying things, and, and, and we see this in the epistles of John as well. We have seen, we have touched, we have known this person. Yeah. And we're writing to you mm. about him because we had a relationship with him that we want to convey to you because you can't possibly get the sense of what it's like yeah. to have spent three years with him. Peter was grappling with the same thing. Paul was completely different. He'd yeah. never met Jesus during Jesus' ministry. This is what I was going to do. Just to bring Ian in, I was going to throw to Ian without any warning, what are the distinctives that separate Peter from Paul? But you were rolling into it. Sorry. So, no, no, it's well, good. Well, no, no, I mean, it's a good question. Yeah. I mean, uh, Peter focused upon the ministry to the Jews and Paul focused on his ministry t to the Gentile mm. Christians. Mm. Uh, and... Um, I mean, that in essence is the initial difference, although later on the lines became, as the church developed, the lines became a little bit more... And Peter knew the Lord Jesus personally. Well, yeah. well, exactly. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> we actually have plenty of time, so I'll just leave Ian to carry on. Do you know, funnily enough, why is it that I don't interrupt Alan, but I interrupt Ian? That's another question. A, a, a number of the, <laughs> the number of views have actually said that. Have said that, Come but it, it doesn't matter. I, 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 I feel reprimanded. I, no, no, don't feel reprimanded. No. I, I don't self-reprimanded. But yes, uh, yeah. Pete, you ask the questions yes. that you're enthusiastic to answer. Yes. That's to a yes. good short. <laughs> <laughs> Please answer. But but yeah, Peter. Um, 
um, was with Christ. He was a fisherman. He was called. We see something of his character. Uh, you know, he, the betrayal of Christ um, at the crucifixion, then his reinstatement where Jesus asks him three times, do he love him? And then his commission, uh, you know, upon, I believe that it, the Greek says, uh, upon this rock, pointing to himself, Christ, mm -hmm. you will build the church. Mm -hmm. Peter, you shall, Simon Peter, you shall be called uh, Peter, Petra, the rock but upon this rock you shall build your church. In other words, it is upon him. And that's interesting because he's an apostle of whom? Not the church, but of Jesus Christ. Mm. And so that, that's really what he, he has done. So he's been with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the Lord Jesus Christ took this man, from which we get the word impetuous, meaning someone who speaks before he thinks. That's right. I was trying to illustrate it, you see, earlier. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Just thought, well, there's, there's a yeah. little bit of a yeah. connection to his and, name and, there. And so, and so God, God, uh, Jesus calls this man. And that's an encouragement to us all, really, that, that God can take various different characters and mould them and use them in his uh, kingdom. Mm. And just to do a little bit of background, I mean, as Alan said, it was written probably about AD 60, 65, although if you're reading some of the commentaries, you might find that it was, someone says it was written under the, uh, the persecution of uh, Domitian uh, in AD 81, 85 or something like that. But AD 60, 65 places it in the reign of Claudius and Nero. Now, if you know anything about Claudius, you'll know that Claudius w was an accidental emperor. And basically, he wanted to endear himself to the, uh, the aristocracy, the Roman aristocracy. So he reintroduced the worship of the empress and re-emphasized uh, Roman, as it were, history and, and Roman culture. And so that brought them into a clash with Christians who, you know, and this is, you'll see this later on when he, he's talking about, you know, offerings and, and such like. But, but you, you also, it could place him in the reign of Nero. And if you know anything about Nero as well, you know, a terrible persecution started with the Emperor Nero who needed someone to blame for his own inadequacies. And so he blamed the Christians, and so there was a terrible persecution happened in there. So that's why he talks here about persecution. Mm. Okay. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I can't, I, 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 uh, it's very difficult to visualize Peter and Paul, but there are two classic epic films. One, one is Barabbas, um, which Peter features in, and the other is Quo Vardis which Paul features in, and, and I find them very helpful. You, you, you get this sense of the oppression of the Roman, mm. um, you know, N Nero especially in Quo, Quo Vardis and, and his greed, you know, in wanting to create this new Rome, so he burns, mm. you know, the current Rome and then blames it on the Christians. It's, it, it's a shockingly wicked world yeah. that they're in. But I'm looking at Peter's life. So he starts as a fisherman, and then he ends, <laughs> almost he's carried along on this incredible journey. The Lord even said, you'll be taken to places you, you, know, you haven't planned to go on. Um, he, he, he's heading up a church. Well, he's I about to be terribly persecuted. Yeah. I mentioned that in his second letter, he mentions Paul's letters and he mentions Paul. <clears throat> Conversely, Paul mentions Peter in some of his letters. And it's interesting because Paul said, I make sure that I don't um, live off the church. He said, I am entitled to, mm. and I'm entitled to take a wife with me on these journeys, and all the expenses should rightly be paid for by the church. He's just making a statement of fact. That's how things should be because we are serving Christ, who's the head of the church, and therefore our expenses should be met by the collections. But he said, I'm reluctant to do that, therefore I provide for myself and I spend my own money in journeying and living expenses and things like that. 
but I am entitled to. So somebody like Peter is entitled to, and he, 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 you know, he is um, supported, financially supported by the church. So I'm only mentioning that because mm. of what you said about he was financially supported by fishing. Yeah. Then he had a complete change of career. And it's very important for us to understand this, that God looks after us, mm. Mm. and it really doesn't matter whether we're fishermen or itinerant preachers, which, what, uh, which is uh, something that Peter became, mm or an apostle or whatever title or whatever role you play in the church, mm. God is your employer mm. and you derive your resources from him. Not just financial resources, you derive your spiritual resources. Yeah. He's the one who gives you the gifts. Mm. Corinthians talks about spiritual gifts and you draw on those spiritual gifts. Jesus himself said, certain people are given talents <coughs> And what matters isn't how much you receive to start with. Mm. What matters is what you do with it. That's right. How you use it. So Peter is modeling his use of the talents he was given. Mm. Yes, Jesus personally said, you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Mm. Yes, Jesus personally said, feed my sheep. Mm three times. Yeah. So Peter is fulfilling that call. Yeah. Paul had a different call. Mm. What and is interesting, co comparing the two, is that Paul, were, you know, studied under Gamaliel. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a highly educated man. Um, Peter, they said, oh, you know, he's a Gal Galilean. Um, he was, uh, you know, how can, how can they be speaking in other tongues? You know, in other words, he was a simple chap, for a fisherman. You wouldn't have expected him to be so well versed. But actually, it's an absolute, you know, magnus opus. It, it's, a, it's an incredible couple of letters absolutely, written. Absolutely. So something dramatically quickened him, you know, in his mind as much as in his spirit. And to, we've, we've also said in previous Bible studies, the Christian life is transformative. Mm. It transforms you. Mm. And look at the transformation Peter went through in the few hours of the Passion. Yes. And the few days to the resurrection. Yeah. Now we're talking, take, take, talking three decades yeah. Yeah. or more. Mm. If it's uh, AD 60, AD 80, it doesn't really matter. It was decades after the transformation at Pentecost. Yeah. So he's a completely different person now, yeah. completely different. So he's able to say an apostle of Jesus Christ in the sense of the one sent out by him. Mm. Both Paul and Peter can say exactly the same thing. The circumstances were different, the call is different, but it's the same Lord yeah. and they have the same objective. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, that's a bit of biography. Uh, geography. He's, he's talking about the, this church, um, you know, where it has spread at the time yeah. he's writing. Well, um, it, it could be that um, what would, well, I, we know that, that what it is is that it's the same, as it were, area of Asia Minor as we talked about when we were studying Colossians. Mm basically. The interesting thing is, is uh, the phrase he uses, the pilgrims of the dispersion. Mm. And I was trying to work out the date, I'm not quite, I can't remember the date when, when uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila were expelled from Rome. Um, it was under Claudius. It was under Claudius, wasn't yeah. it? So it's round well, about according to Suetonius, I can't. But he basically yeah. said that it, it, it was around about the same time. So he might be talking about when he talks about pilgrims of dispersion, mm -hmm. might be talking about mm -hmm. uh, these people. That would fit in with the dates of between AD sixty and sixty-five. But if it was a later letter, then that would it would fit into the dispersion of the Jews in AD sixty-nine when they were thrown out of Jerusalem. Whatever, I mean, the point 
got it noted somewhere. The, the point... Uh, AD 49, I, according to Suetonius, yeah. AD 49 was when Claudius yeah. expelled the Jews. Expelled, That's yeah. right. So, but the main thing is that there are two dates. One is 49 and one is 69, 20 yeah. years apart. Yeah. One was the Jews kicked out of Rome and the other is Jews kicked out of Jerusalem. Yeah. Mm. But Nero uh, readmitted the Jews um, to Rome. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Yes, it made me think what I said earlier yeah. about being under the reign of Claudius. Uh, that, that, yeah. that, might, that might be incorrect. I need to check yeah. that. Okay, sure. I need to check that. Sure. I mean, yeah. Sorry if but I... But I think it does, there's something in, in... It is in that era. It is in that era. I, I get so confused because there were four emperors in one year. Well... And, that, and, that, yeah. and then I okay. give up on Roman history. I'll, I'll check up on my dates. Yeah. Uh, interesting phrase, pilgrims of the dispersion. The interesting thing is the word pilgrim. Mm. And we know the word pilgrim from the Pilgrim Fathers, you know, how they came across from England uh, across to the eastern seaboard of the United States of America. And there were pilgrim people. And, and um, you, you, I've not come across that phrase used to describe Christians, which is a very apt phrase mm. when you think mm. about it, because we're expected to be pilgrims. And I, I think I've said this before. If, if I have, please forgive me. But the, 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 we are supposed to be a pilgrim people. And what I mean by that is that um, the difference between the tabernacle and the temple was the tabernacle was built to be portable mm -hmm. uh, and the people of God were meant to move on. Mm. Where we get our problems <laughs> is where the, the temple became permanent mm. and then the monarchy became permanent. Uh, uh, and and I, I think that is an illustration about church life, for example, a church might grow and be established and be a pilgrim people and a pilgrim church moving on. And suddenly you get your pastors, you get your, you get your, oh, we need a church building, we build a church building, we get loaded down with debt. And soon we become a very static people, you know, from yeah. once we were a pilgrim people. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it is a... Um, and for the benefit of uh, readers who, you know, I read Pilgrim's Progress as I was oh, growing yes. up and mm. things like that, so we kind of know what Pilgrim means, but just for the sake of completeness, it means temporary abode. It means that they don't consider where they're currently living as their normal permanent home. So that can be people who got kicked out of their home in Rome or kicked out of their home in Jerusalem, but their heart isn't there. Mm. Their heart is back. <clears throat> it could be journey, people who journey mm. on a, a trade a trip. Yeah, yeah. It, it could be that kind of... It, it's not a religious mm. word, mm. although we do now tend to use it within a Christian context if we're talking about pilgrims in that sense. Mm. Mm. But what it means, it, it means two things. I think mm. that Peter deliberately wanted to superimpose two ideas. Mm. One is that we're pilgrims in the sense that we belong in heaven, not on earth, but we're living on earth. Mm. And our life on earth is temporary. Our permanent life is with Christ. And our future life is the new mm. heavens and the new earth mm. Mm. after the resurrection. So this is temporary, yeah. but literally they're, temp they're temporary because they've been kicked out of their home and they're now scattered. Can I just, um, I always, uh, in my early teens, I memorized and I, I remember there's a hill overlooking RAF Lynham where there's a little plaque written and it's by a hymn writer and I've forgotten which one it is, but I'll try and remember it later. And it it's, it's along a, a, a pathway by a lady called Maud Heath. So this plaque, and I thought, oh, I'll, I'll try and memorize that. And it was, um, if pause ye at this aerial heights where Maud Heath's pathway um, winds in shade or lights, Christian wayfarer in a world of strife, be still and ponder on the path of life. And it is this sense that we are traveling. Wayfarers. We're wayfarers. Absolutely. Of course, you have seafarers as well. But it's a lovely, th uh, you know, th th we were talking about being impetuous earlier. Th th things are going so fast today 
that people don't see themselves as pilgrims at all. They see themselves as sort of bound to the watch and to clocking in and clocking out, watching the telly program, doing this. And, but th th there's a sense of a pilgrim where you, you, you are doing it in a measured way. That's yeah, right. To and a destination. And the other thing is your time frame is different mm. from the residents. Yeah. The residents of the town, whose home it is, yeah. They've got their lives, they've got their relatives, they've got their friends, they've got their social, everything, the whole time frame, mm. it's local. Your time frame is much wider mm. because your time frame doesn't end here, it ends back home. Yeah. And your time frame started somewhere else and will finish somewhere else. Mm. And I think we need to be permanently conscious in our heads as Christians that our time frame is eternal. Mm. And he deals with this mm. time frame yeah absolutely straight away he absolutely. goes he hits it straight away elect yeah. according to the foreknowledge of god the father mm. so he's going way back to even before we were born god's knowledge of our pilgrimage predates mm. our own birth that's mm. the time scale mm. that peter is introducing into these couple of opening verses mm. And then brings in sanctification you know, and obedience. He, he does get a lot into those early yeah. verses. Yeah. Just, uh, just check the dates, Bruno. Okay, it. yeah. Claudius and reign ended AD 54, mm -hmm. and Nero started AD 54 and went on to 68 AD. Yeah. So yeah. It's the, the reign of this letter, if we believe it's 60, 65, is Nero. The point I made earlier about Claudius was valid because he did re-establish the traditions of the Roman Empire, mm. which made it very difficult mm. for the early church. Just interjecting that. again, I'm not a pedant, but I, but um, 67, 68, because that wasn't it. Vespasian went into Rome in 67, and then Titus followed Vespasian. You, got, the, the, six, I might be slightly 68, 69, 69. Excuse me, I've got my year 69, out. 69. That's when they had the, the year. Emperors. With anyway, the, anyway, the, the, the point four I'm making. Emperor 69. Remember it, that. It wasn't. It wasn't. I. I. I, I was doing it from yeah. memory, and no, I remember, but I remember the sort of rigidity of uh, the Claudian reign and the re-establishment. That's why the Jews were thrown out. We're going to have basically Roman traditions, and and that caused tensions yeah. and then you had Nero building upon that mm. uh, at all so that that's what was the cause of all the persecution which Peter is speaking into yes yeah and, yes. and I just I wanted for completion because I yeah. I didn't like to mislead anybody um, into it um, but interesting what you say how he introduces the the elect mm. according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit mm. for obedience and sprinkling blood of Jesus Christ. So now, th this, this, is, this is interesting here because um, Peter introduces a, a phrase here where we talk about the elect. Now, those people who, those Christians who believe in uh, what we would call Calvinism mm -hmm. uh, and the five points of Calvinism w would actually say that the elect means completely uh, those who are, have been set aside by God, uh, right? Now, Peter here introduces a qualification to that understanding where he actually says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, mm -hmm. the Father. Now, now you know, and, and, in, and I'm thinking where it talks about in uh, Galatians, where it talks elect according to the foreknowledge of God as well, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll... Mm -hmm. Check that again, mm. but but the point I'm making here is that um, you can actually look at this elect in two different ways. One that God knows and God wants to call, but that doesn't mean it's automatic. It has to be a response. Mm -hmm. Whereas a very rigid Calvinist would say, elect means that we have no say in the matter. Yeah. That that we are called, and we have no we have no alternative but That's to right. respond yeah. to yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. all about God, mm. but the 
as were a modification of that mm. is that yes we're elect but we we actually elect according to the foreknowledge of God and have the ability to respond or reject mm. Yeah, so I think in if it's Ephesians that says... Ephesians, yeah. Ephesians was... I read it up. Yeah. Yeah, sure. But is it, this is an interesting point to, to expand on. Yeah. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, mm. according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Um, can I just um, just interject? We, we, we spend a bit of time thinking, you know, should we study Philippians? Oh no, we've just done Paul, but now we're back to Paul in Ephesians. You can't yeah. escape. There is but one. Just a point to make on that Ephesians yeah. passage, because some would say, well, the, the pre-destination, um, uh, as it were, where it says he chose us in him before the creation of the world, some would say that is the choice, it was God's plan f corporately, rather than, so some take it as, each individual is predestined. Some say, ah, oh, the, the church is predestined. It's, it's a difference. Yeah. You know, it, the it, corporate it a... body is chosen before the foundation of the earth. Um, uh, but some would say, oh, no, it is each individual. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I take the latter. If I, yes, if I, if I had to jump one way or the other with Ephesians, I would definitely jump on the individual side because mm. from the language, from the way Paul is writing, yeah. to me it's very clear. Yeah that <clears throat> we were predestined mm. uh, before the foundation of the world. I have no doubt whatsoever with that. And to I have be no, holy and blameless. Yeah, so we, we have no, I have no issue with that. But what I would say about the elect is, the word elect in Peter is slightly different mm. because the elect could be seen as a form of invitation. If you remember the parable of Jesus, at the wedding feast, he had invited the elect, but half of them didn't show up. Mm. They said, oh, I, I've got a new cow, I've got to test it, and I've got this new field, and I've got to this, and I've got, just got married, or whatever, it, all these excuses Fair keep dripping. Father. And he said, go out in the highways and byways and just grab anyone off the streets because I will have guests at this wedding. So it's a, it's a story, it's a parable. Mm. It's a very powerful parable. I am willing to accept that this word elect is in that vein. Mm -hmm. Peter is simply saying that through Isaiah, through Moses, through all the prophets, all the Jews in the first century, around the time he was writing, AD 60, whatever, mm -hmm. all the Jews, God has made provision for them to accept Christ and see eternity. And he may well be using that word elect in that sense because he is writing to the Jews who've been scattered. <coughs> he names the places that they've been scattered to, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. But in one sense, where they're scattered to is not relevant. Where their heart is and where their home is is what's relevant. Mm. These are just examples of places that they have ended up mm. as pilgrims. Mm. But the elect is they haven't been elected to go and live in those towns. That's not the election. The election is, according to the foreknowledge, in sanctification of the spirit. Mm. Salvation is what yeah. is. Yeah, that's they've what been they've elected to salvation. For. Yeah. And it's, it's up to them to respond. The, the, okay. the verses I was thinking of are not one in Galatians, Romans, no. where it says, uh, it says in Romans, 828, for we know that in all things God works for the good of those who call him, who have been called according to his purpose. Mm. For those he foreknew, mm. he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, mm. that he might be firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And though he, those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he justified, and those he justified, mm. he glorified. Mm. Amazing verse, isn't it? Because it doesn't no. have sanctification in that no. verse. Um, yeah. I, 
I, I think we, we have to push this a little bit further because when we're talking about elect and predestination, I, I think we, 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 we can't leave it there because we have to actually push it a little bit further and say, well, what does that mean about our discipleship? Now, obviously, when we're talking about election, we're actually saying the calling comes from God. This salvation comes from God. The sanctification comes from God. Mm. That's the power. The last one you've just said is an interesting one because yeah. many think, oh, well, I'm the one through yeah. my obedience. So, 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 it's, it's, so it's all about God. Mm. So, so, so that's the first thing in the sense that, that that's a very important picture of the election. Mm. Now, the problem with that view is that it, it, it can end up being distorted, meaning that it has nothing to do with me. Um, I, I, I would say, you know, if it wouldn't say for whom he called, he foreknew. In other words, there's a calling, and if, the, if there's a calling, there's an implication of a response. And so I, I would say that along with the foreknowledge of God, there has to be a response mm. to that mm. calling. Mm. Now, in the end, and I, and I, I keep hearing the lecturer in, 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 in New Testament always say, don't declare the mystery too soon. <laughs> because yeah. Christians uh, often say, Ah, well, it's a, it <laughs> it's, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. And I don't, I'm, I'm aware that I don't want to declare the mystery too soon because right. by understanding it helps us to be able to... Well, think a bit more. Think a bit more. Mm. But, but there is a mystery in the sense that we're looking beyond the time into eternity. Mm. And it may be that even though God calls us and we don't respond then, we could respond some other time, mm. Right. It may Sorry. even be that God, in his grace, calls us and has set us aside. Uh, and it may be even a deathbed conversion. Mm, that's right. Uh, you know, it, it, it could be even as God in his grace mm. like that. Mm. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 a, it's all good theology, isn't it? I mean, he, he's got, there's an element of us, you know, with obedience, I well, think the before, sanctifying work. That's well, it. Before, if we okay. see the sanctification speaks of salvation. Mm -hmm. That's what He's done for us. Mm -hmm. This gives us security. Mm -hmm. We're going to go to heaven. Yeah. Well, we're going to be resurrected at the last day, uh, to be more um, accurate. The sanctification is something that uh, permits us to be saved permits us to survive death. Mm -hmm. But the next bit is the counterpoint, which is right. obedience. Mm -hmm. And there is a danger that lots of Christians want to stop at the sanctification point mm -hmm. and don't want to read on to obedience and sprinkling of the blood. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, sanctification leads to something on our part, mm -hmm. and that is obedience. And if I don't see a Christian who's being obedient, I have to question whether they've been truly sanctified mm -hmm. and have gone through the real process of sanctification. Because if they have gone through the real process of sanctification, if they're truly a believer, mm -hmm. the transformative power of the Holy Spirit will turn them into obedient persons. Mm -hmm. Obedient. My, my antenna has just gone up because of people watching who don't know all the Christian jargon. So we just need to s explain what sanctification is. The, the, the word literally means becoming like a saint of God. It, it's mm. basically being like Christ-like in our mm. behaviour and our attitudes. And this is a work of the Holy Spirit. And that's why it says here, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. But we can... We can receive the Holy Spirit, we can be open to the Holy Spirit, we can quench the Holy Spirit, and we can resist the Holy Spirit. All those phrases mm. are phrases which are found in the New Testament. Mm. In other words, it isn't an automatic thing that you immediately 
sanctified, become more like Christ. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a process, and mm -hmm. it's, it's directly proportional to, first of all, our salvation, the sprinkling of the blood mm. of Jesus Christ, but it's also about our openness to the Spirit of God mm. and our willingness to allow the Spirit of God to change us. And now how that works, it works through uh, the Holy Spirit working in our conscience, bringing to our awareness a particular area of our life which needs to be dealt with. And, and we then present it to the Lord, that particular area. I think it was Karl Barth who said that the conscience is the only place between heaven and earth uh, where, where God and God meets man, basically. And, and in, in, in that sense, I can't remember the exact phrase, but he, he's basically saying that this, it's, it's in our conscience when, you know, when God we feel convicted about a particular thing. It's, it's not that God is trying to make us feel bad, but he's drawing us attention to a particular area of our life which is stopping us being sanctified, mm. becoming more Christ-like in our attitude and behavior mm. and language. And when he brings that to our attention, we have two choices. We can say, Lord, act. I present this area of my life to you. Act. Help me be different, or we can say, not a problem, let's move on. Yes. And, 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 and when we say no God, or no, That's no, right. then something dies mm. in yeah. our walk with mm. Christ. Mm. And so mm. it has to be, goes back to this pilgrim. Mm. We should be moving on mm. in our Christian life all the time. We shouldn't stand still. And sanctification is not a static thing that happens when we're saved. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing process of becoming more like Christ-like. Yeah. And I think Peter, at the end of it says, we shall be like him when we see him. Yeah. You yeah. Know, and that's the end of the process. Yes, yeah, so I, 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 what I love about this verse, it's like the, the verse that says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling because God is at work in you. It's, yeah. it, there's a balance there. And I like the way you've described this work of the Spirit that we can quench, we can grieve. Yeah. It's the work of the Spirit. Amen. But we have to be obedient. Yeah. And, um, and, and again, you know, r r beginning of Romans, you know, I pray that you'll, you'll, you'll know the obedience that comes from faith. And well, faith is God-given. In a way, obedience is a consequence because, to me, sanctification, the process of sanctification results in me being pure, more pure than I was before the sanctification process took place. Yeah. And that process of sanctification makes me more Christ-like, as Ian says. Mm -hmm. Equally, that process of sanctification makes me obedient to Christ. Even that process of sanctification makes me a better husband, a better father. Mm. It just makes me somebody who's closer to mm. the image of God than I was before. Right. But part and parcel of that transformation of sanctification is obedience. So you don't earn sanctification through being obedient. That doesn't work that way. It's completely the other way around that through sanctification, <clears throat> our whole nature becomes pure mm. and our whole attitude becomes obedient, mm. which is why he puts that straight after he sanctification. He puts, puts it straight in and, and, then, and then puts in the, the sprinkling. I mean, if there's any doubt about who has, is doing the work, you know, to have that at the end, the sprinkling of the blood, to be covered by... Christ, uh, you this know, over the doorpost. This is the thing. You know, this lintel is, and doorpost. This is the thing. We, we can't read this without again going back to the Gospels and going back to the history yeah. of actually what happened. Mm. And we learn from John's Gospel, Peter's best friend John was at Christ's side at the cross mm. when the blood came out of his side. Peter wasn't, he'd done a runner. And he must have regretted that for the rest of his life. And yet 20, 30, 40 years later... He's made the connection. He's making the connection when he's saying the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So both in the literal sense, mm. he's fully aware from John's account and Mary's account and all the women who were <clears throat> at the crucifixion, who saw what happened, mm. the, the shedding of Jesus' blood poured onto the ground. He knew 
from his reading of the Torah, the significance of the sprinkling, the sprinkling of blood. And there's something about, you know, it, at Passover where there was the same sequence of connection, faith in God's word, obedience in sprinkling the blood. But it was actually God, as it were, who, that provided the covering that then led to their deliverance. Um, so it's a work of God, their deliverance, and yet they're in the middle of it. God, God um, required that they should sprinkle that blood. That's right. It's not doing that much, it's just being and, obedient. And we really... <laughs> See, John the Baptist was sent to announce and identify Jesus. Mm, I know. It's powerful. So the thing is that in the first century, the Jews were expecting Messiah. Mm. But A, they didn't know when he would come, and B, they knew that they couldn't identify him until Elijah said, that's him. Yeah. That's John the Baptist. Now, just before you go to this famous verse, was Peter there? He wasn't, was he? When, when no. John said, behold, is that what you're going to go to? I'm going to go to there. Peter himself wasn't there at the no. time. No. He, he came along later, after John had identified Messiah. Pity, really, because he may, the, may, may have saved him from misunderstandings later on. But, yeah. Here's what the... We, we've been doing Isaiah for of a couple of years. Here's what the Jews knew about Messiah. They didn't know his name. They didn't know his birth date, so they didn't know what era he would come in. They knew what he would do. He would liberate them, which is what Isaiah said. But they also knew he would be a descendant of David. He would be born in Bethlehem. There are various physical sure. things he knew about sure. Messiah. But they also knew, that, uh, like, uh, as it says in Malachi and also Isaiah, you know, how beautiful are the feet of him, brings good news. They knew that a person like John the Baptist would announce him and identify him. Mm. And then that's exactly what happened in uh, John's uh, gospel. It says that John saying of himself, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So he self-identified himself from Isaiah 40. Mm. Having done that, um, he, he, he says the same thing that you just said in verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I had said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him. I did not know him means I didn't know who Jesus was. He did. They're both about 30 years old. They're cousins. They more or less grew up together. So of course he knew who Jesus was as his relative, as a person, as somebody who did permits for the same time more or less he did. Who They both went to Jerusalem to learn at the temple. They both went to the feasts. He knew who Jesus was in human terms, but something happened Something mm. happened when he was at the Jordan. Mm. At Bethany. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, 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 um, baptizing people. Mm. And then when Jesus showed up, something clicked and he said, I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. Mm. And then he saw the Spirit and he identified Jesus. Mm. So this is what Peter is referring to. So, Ian, I don't think we're going to escape from these first verses, but have you got another thought I, on I, this? Yeah, I, yeah. I just want us to, to think theologically about the, and pastorally and practically about this whole area uh, of sanctification, because I think it's an important area that if we're called by Christ, we are expected to be different. And if we're not different, people begin to, as Alan mm. said, question our very faith. Now, in Romans 8, it's the passage which deals with basically the Holy Spirit and, and, and God working in our hearts. And, and the Apostle Paul writes this, mm. verse 13, Romans 8, For if we live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. 
uh, for as many as led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. You didn't receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, where we cry, Abba, Father. Uh, and what what the, these verses is saying is actually it's describing the process of putting to death sanctification. It is not it is not sort of like us sitting back and waiting for God to act. It's about us responding to God all the time. I, I and as I was thinking upon this. That's why I went quiet for about 10 minutes because I, I was trying to remember something from Thomas Akempis mm -hmm. and the Imitation of Christ. An excellent book, mm. really. It, mm. It's talking about his relationship. Now, it is a little bit too Catholic for me, but mm -hmm. nevertheless, I, he, he does get across some important points and he's talking about well, this... The Protestants hadn't arrived by then. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, yeah. But he does, get a, he does get across the point I'm making because sometimes because of which uh, because of the, the, as it were, the result of charismatic renewal, there is a tendency to think it's all about God. Mm. But he writes this, he says this. Remember what Paul has just said in, in Romans mm. 8. He says this to Thomas Akempis. If each year we would root out one fault, we should soon become perfect. But alas, the opposite is true. Uh, that we often were better and purer in the beginning of our conversion than after many years of our profession. Our zeal and our virtue should grow daily, but is now to be held a fine thing if a man retains even a little bit of their first further. It would be, it would be do it, if only we would do a little bit more violence to ourselves at first, we would later be enabled to do everything easily and gladly. I mean, what, what he's basically, he's, he's He's actually projecting this theory that if we if we just got better each day, mm. we we'd soon be perfect. I know if you read it later on, he knows he's, yeah. we're not yeah. going to be perfect. But what the point he's making is that we should be progressing as Christians yeah. to this whole point. What Peter talks about about uh, we shall be like him, for mm. we shall see him as he is. You know, we should be progressing like that. But so often we're more keen at the beginning than we are mm. where we are now. Mm. And we have to ask ourselves, is it because we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts? Mm. We're not being sanctified mm. as we ought. Mm. Mm. It is an ongoing, it's the sort of present continuous, be yeah. being filled. And um, uh, so you haven't arrived until you arrive in glory. The interesting thing is in that passage in Romans 8, it, it says, you know, those whom... God foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son and those yeah. in it. But it misses out sanctification. Yeah. Well, it's well, basically it's... says, and those he justified, he also glorified. So the danger in sanctification, like this is the lesson I learned from it, um, is that we think we're achieving it. But actually, it's God, it's the work no, of no, God. I'm not... He glorified. No, I'm not saying you are, I'm just no. saying it's a good little lesson, the fact that it isn't in that sequence, no, yeah. that God justifies God glorifies. No, I, I'm not, I, I mean, I know that yeah. you're not, no, I know you understand what I'm saying, but it's important the viewers understand. I'm yeah. not saying it's about us as we're pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. Mm. But what it is, is about listening to the Holy Spirit as he speaks to our conscience about certain aspects of our life. Mm. And we have a choice each time mm. to say yes or no. Mm. And if we say no, something dies in that relationship. Mm. And if we are spiritually as it were, walking and drifting along the bottom and we're no lot further forward than we were years ago, mm. then I, you can trace it back to when the Holy Spirit said something to our hearts and we said no. Thank you very much. Alan, we literally the last 30 seconds, grace and peace be yours in abundance. we just finish off verse um, 2. Well, at one level it's uh, greeting Peter, an apostle, to such and such grace and peace be multiplied but it's a living a greeting mm -hmm. it's real it's full mm. thank you and thank you grace and peace be also to you in abundance see you next week mm -hmm.